So I'm really excited to say that we've had uh, two amazing sessions so far, one with the uh, Asia-Pacific News Leaders panel, and then, of course, in conversation with uh, Jeff Widener and Christy Lou Stout. And we're going to continue that on with our third session uh, with Joyce Howe of Google Asia-Pacific, also a very good friend and a stalwart AAJA Asia member. So uh, she's going to walk us through some uh, tips and tricks for pros uh, that Google can offer. I also want to say that Google is a very uh, large sponsor for this year's AAJA uh, JMSC conference. So I'm just going to hand the microphone over to Joyce. Everyone, please welcome Joyce. Thank you so much, Ramey. Thanks, everyone. I'm conscious that I'm the only thing that's standing between you and fried chicken. So I'm going to try to make this as fun, as interactive as possible for you all. So I'd really appreciate um, your attention. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn back to where we left off with the editorial panel up here. First thing in the morning, we talked about the future of digital journalism and what that means for journalist pros like yourselves. Um, obviously, the digital landscape is something we think about a lot at Google. Um, and all the things that we mentioned um, early in the morning about uh, mobile being first and the, uh, just the sheer level of penetration that's going to take place here in Asia, it's all true. And I just wanted to give you a few pictorial examples of exactly that trend. So first thing, this clicker will work. Oh, sorry. OK. Clicker's kind of insensitive. OK. Um, this is a, probably a pretty familiar scene to most of you. Um, if you ever have been on a uh, subway train, this, is, this happens to be in Taipei, Taiwan. Um, just look at the sheer demographic of this. Young and old, men and women, they're all glued to their smartphones and tablets. And this is something that's really, really advanced in Asia. I just want this to emphasize, um, show you this to emphasize the, um, the how advanced it is here. Um, meanwhile, you know, we've got broadband here, uh, 4G um, and the MTR. Meanwhile, people in the states and Europe are still debating whether or not to have connectivity underground. Uh, so. And just to emphasize something about watch time on YouTube, um, here in Asia, for instance, in Japan and Korea, over 60% of the watch time for YouTube comes from mobile devices. So it is exactly like Alan said earlier, it's definitely a mobile first uh, region. And it's not just young people and um, uh, other people glued to their uh, Korean dramas on YouTube, it's monks. Uh, I was in Siem Reef a couple months ago, and you really do see a lot of new kinds of people coming online for the very first time. And what are they doing it on? They're doing it on their tablets and their mobile phones. And it's not just, uh, you know, desktop computers being disrupted. It's even things like mirrors. So uh, this lady here is using her smartphone um, as her makeup touch-up mirror. I want to tell you a tale of two taxis. So this is me. Uh, a couple months ago, we were in Taipei. We were doing a big uh, event there. And we climbed into this taxi, and I saw no fewer than four different screens in the interior of this cab. And I asked the taxi driver, why do you have four different screens, one in your dashboard, one hung up over the back seat, one um, you know, like right over his steering wheel? And he said, enthusiastically launched into this demo of Google Maps. Um, and he said, you know, just with my voice alone, I can tell it to take me to uh, Taipei 101, and it'll give me directions. And then I was like, OK, so what is the screen in the dashboard used for? And he was like, oh, that I use for karaoke. <laughs> and then he proceeded to take out two wireless mics from his dashboard, and we had a bit of a karaoke party. Uh, it was awesome. <laughs> but the point I wanted to make with this slide here is um, he hooked this all up himself. You know, he just did this with consumer devices that he found in a mall, um, and you know, he just he just rigged this whole get up himself, complete with surround sound. So, you know, and the fact that it's all super speed, you know, um, hooked up to the internet, um, getting real time results on Google Maps, that's that's pretty awesome. But you might just think it's for East Asia, right? Places that have good connectivity. Um, what about places like India or Indonesia? Well. This is a tuk-tuk driver in Mumbai, in India. This picture's a little dark here, but uh, I don't know if you can see that on the upper, oops, left-hand corner, there's a Wi-Fi symbol. So it's a fully Wi-Fi enabled tuk-tuk. Uh, there's the router up here. And on the, up here, he says you can even uh, recharge your mobile phones right from his tuk-tuk's full service. You can get some extra tokens if you buy it from him. 
Um, so one of the most, and plus there's a screen here. Uh, so one of the most amazing things is, um, as you noticed, everything is on mobile. Everyone is using mobile phones only. They're, they're leapfrogging right from the whole desktop computer, even laptop experience, straight to mobile phones and tablet computers. So I can't emphasize this enough. When you're thinking of your uh, next billion of people coming online for the first time, consuming your news, consuming the media, they're doing it all on mobile phones, right? So desktop, the desktop experience is not even relevant to them. So um, that's what I'm gonna leave you with. And then uh, now I'm gonna kind of take a leap into the bread and butter of this presentation, which is to kind of equip you with tools, tips and tricks on how you can better use uh, Google in your reporting. So obviously I know that Google is probably part of all of your everyday lives. Um, search starts with Google generally. Um, but there are some things that are kind of underneath the surface that I hope will help you when you're looking in, um, into a topic more deeply for a piece of, uh, for a report, um, or even for your job searches. So, um, oh, sorry, and this one more slide about the, the penetration of uh, smartphones in Asia Pacific. You can just see how much faster the rise of it is than anywhere else in the world. Okay, so a quick comparison, uh, just a, kind of an icebreaker. So here at Google, um, I actually do a, a segment with Ramey, like he mentioned, uh, on the Wall Street Journal on Google Trends. So we comment about what people are searching for in Asia, the latest internet memes, things that people are looking at. Um, so we get a lot of uh, insight into the back end of the, this data. So uh, we also get to see which countries are searching more for what things. So a uh, quick pop quiz or just a guess, where are people searching more for Christy Lustout? Hong Kong or Singapore? Hong Kong, okay, where she's based, yeah? Actually, it's Singapore. So, Christy, you're, you're big in Singapore. <laughs> okay, so we actually looked at the uh, trends graph of Christy Lustout versus Jeff Widener. Um, and this chart alone can tell you quite a bit, right, about the trends. Christy Lustout is obviously a lot more popular than Jeff, sorry. <laughs> But one thing that we notice is the cyclical nature of this, right? Every June, June 4th, um, Jeff Widener gets searched for a lot more. Um, I don't know what accounts for this bump in November. Maybe it was his birthday. Um, but so here at Google, we definitely have insight into the, this, uh, this amount of search volumes. And I want to tell you that it's available for everyone on um, this google.com slash trends, which we'll talk about a little later. Ah, the old favorite question, Apple versus Android. Uh, so I wanted to look at, you know, here in our region, here in Asia, which countries care more about Apple and which countries care more about Android. So this is the chart for Apple, and I guess not surprisingly, Japan. Um, and by the way, this is compared against all of the world. So um, searches for Apple are the highest in Asia, even more than in Europe or in the US. And uh, Japan, you know, with kind of 88% of global searches coming from Japan. Uh, interestingly enough, Cambodia and Thailand, um, and Singapore, favorite Singapore, uh, 100%. Now, let's compare this with Android. So Indonesia, huge market for Android, uh, open source platform, a lot of OEMs are installing Android on their smartphones for users there. India, same story. But you know what's really crazy is Iran. So that was really, really surprising to me. Okay, so it's World Cup fever. You know, we're heating up. Uh, we're getting ready to not sleep for two weeks uh, to tune in to 3 a.m. matches. Um, soccer is actually really huge in Asia. I probably don't have to explain this to most of you. But um, any guesses for which country out of these three are the most interested in the English national team? I'm hearing Indonesia, I'm hearing Japan a little bit too. It's actually Indonesia. Yeah, so Indonesia is a huge market for football, if you didn't know that already. Uh, I think over 30% of all searches for the World Cup are coming from Indonesia. So the third most, I know it's a crazy statistic, the third most populous country in the world and apparently they're all crazy soccer fanatics. Um, even though Nepal is a tiny country with a really, really low internet penetration, we still get some insight into the kind of Google searches they're making. So, uh, which national team do you think is bigger in Nepal? Brazil? Brazil? 
Okay. It's actually Spain. I guess it's maybe because they're the defending champions or something. Okay, but back to Singapore. Uh, Brazil or Germany? I'm rooting for the Germans, <laughs> just saying. But any guesses? Germany? Yeah, it's actually Germany. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna jump right into search trends. Um, so google.com slash trends. Um, and by the way, you're welcome to take notes or follow along on your laptops, but um, I'm gonna be able to give you the links at the very end, so don't worry too much about taking down everything. Um, it allows you to basically look at what's spiking around the world in terms of search interest. And for, as journalists, it's really applicable if you want to look at um, a certain topic and a trend. It's a great way to hook your readers into saying, you know, searches for this particular thing spiked 70% uh, over the past week. So it's, it's totally free and anyone can go on it and we have insight into pretty much data from every single country in the world. So it's also really useful when you're kind of deciding which terms to use. Uh, so global warming and climate change are kind of interchangeable ideas and I just wanted to do this comparison to see which term resonated more with people, which, which is the phrase that people are using more. So as you can see from this chart, global warming tends to get more search hits than, the, um, than searches for climate change. So if I were a sub-editor, I would probably think, oh, okay, well, if that's the term that resonates more with people, then I might choose to use the phrase global warming. Um, so, continuing on this uh, disasters kind of topic, um, I just wanted to look at the comparisons between typhoons and smogs, smog uh, and floods. And um, you can see the cyclical nature again. We have data dating from all the way back to 2004. And you can see the cyclical nature of typhoons, um, not surprisingly because typhoon season comes around once a year, um, but then floods are kind of more sporadic. So once in a while you get a really, really bad one and people are searching for that. And by the way, you can also compare between countries. So it allows you to compare the searches for the phrase of the word typhoon between Singapore, the Philippines, and Hong Kong. And you can see here the searches in the Philippines are, are much, much higher in volume. Okay, let it go. The hottest meme of the year, probably. Um, so any guesses as to which country in the world is searching the most for this song? And by the way, whoever gets it right gets to hear Raimi sing it at karaoke later. Yeah. Oh my gosh, did you talk to Raimi before this? Okay, you have to sing it later. <laughs> yeah, um, it is the Philippines by a long shot. <laughs> um, the karaoke capital of the world, I think you called it, Raimi. Um, but we looked at also the city breakdown of uh, where searches are uh, taking place, and it's all <laughs> in the Philippines. <laughs> um, so people in the Philippines are crazy obsessed with this song. And I think, you know, this kind of insight might seem a little, you know, funny, weird, offbeat, but um, it gives you a lot of interesting cultural insight and commentary. It allows you to dig a little deeper into the reasons for, you know, why are we seeing this thing? Um, even though Frozen is an American movie, um, you know, Let It Go is huge as in English. Um, it's really, really big in the Philippines, so interesting talking point there. So now I'm going to jump into talking about the uh, tips and tricks um, for how you can better use Google search. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm sure all of you use Google day in and day out, um, especially kind of as a starting point for your stories. Um, but how do you use it more effectively? How do you filter down the results uh, that you get to better get at the kind of heart of your subject matter? Um, so at Google, we've always believed that this perfect search engine, it's not a done deal. Uh, it's far from being perfect, um, and we're continually working on it to make it better and better. This is what it looked like back in 1998. Just a little uh, time travel piece here. Uh, if you remember, it's just 10 blue links, really, really boring. But now, the experience is much richer. So you get this thing called the knowledge panel on the right-hand side that gives you biographical information about a person or just quick facts about an institution or a place. Um, some, here so you get some news results if the person's been in the news um, and a lot of pictures. Now, if I were writing a story on this guy who's been in the news quite a bit, uh, General Prayut Chan Ocha, uh, who is heading up the Thai military coup right now, uh, but I wanted to do an in-depth piece on what, what he was doing before this present coup. Um, I wanted to go back in time to see what people were talking about, about him. So any ideas on how you might do that on Google? Just shout out any kind of queries or, or how you might do that. Yeah, 
you must be a guru. So, <laughs> you, okay, that's absolutely right. So you would click on the search tools, which uh, unfortunately many people miss because it's kind of tucked away up here. But when you click on that, you get a drop down and you get to select a time uh, range. And you can go pretty far back in time, again, back to the kind of early 2000s. And uh, you can either fill in both uh, time frames, you know, the from the two, or just fill in one of them. And then you get to kind of see and filter search results uh, by the date in which they were posted onto the global index. OK, so um, another search tip that I often tell people is about removing certain keywords that you want. Um, Google's really good about searching around the keyword that you plug in. So often it'll give you kind of more than what you ask for. Um, but when you're kind of trying to whittle down the search results, this is quite useful. You just put a little minus sign, or a little hyphen, I guess, um, and then the thing that you're trying to remove and take away from your search results. So let's say I was doing a story on Malaysia, but I didn't care um, about MH370, and that's, that was not the focus of my story. So um, I would just remove all this to make sure that none of my search results um, mention this or were about this. Um, so there's quickly definitions. You just put define and colon in front of the word that you're trying to define. And um, this is really useful. So um, a lot of people don't really know that you can actually borrow Google to make it be a kind of internal search engine for whatever site you're looking for. So let's say you're looking for um, a, a story um, or a thing that was mentioned within a particular domain, let's say the newyorktimes.com. Um, you could just type in site colon nytimes.com or whatever the domain name is. It could be nasa.gov, for instance. Um, and you can just type in um, maybe the, the keyword for what you're looking for, an op-ed or a person's name or whatever. And uh, I just want to show you an example of how this was used to great effect. So um, this is another search you can use, which is a file type. So Google doesn't index just web pages. It also indexes a lot of the documents that have been uploaded online, whether it's PowerPoint presentations, uh, Word documents, PDFs, Excels, you name it. So uh, you can type in file type, colon, and then the three-letter extension for whatever type of file that you're looking for. So let's say I was looking for financial reports uh, in the form of PDFs. So I would probably type in um, you know, financial report, file type, colon, PDF. And I would just get PDFs in my search results. Now, a journalist used this uh, to, to quite great effect when he was doing a story, um, this is from the San Antonio Express News, on the kind of insurance claims that were filed with the San Antonio City Hall. And instead of having to dig through mountains of data, doing this impossible Google search, um, and obviously the folks down at the City Hall weren't very helpful, um, he just performed a search for all the documents that were related to uh, accident claims and insurance claims. Um, and so he used this particular query, so site colon san antonio.gov to look for uh, things that are within that domain. Uh, file type colon PDF injuries. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind when you're dealing with a particularly tricky website that might not have a great internal search engine, you can always use Google to help you out. Um, public data, you can get public data really, really quickly instead of having to dig through the CIA uh, you know, fact book or anything like that, or Wikipedia, um, we basically pull information from the National Bureaus of Statistics from a lot of different countries around the world. So even if you just typed in something as basic as population Ukraine, you can get this quick result uh, right up top here. And if you click Explore More, it'll take you to this page, um, which is the Google Public Data page. Um, I just compared, this is obviously not Ukraine, this is um, China, just comparing the populations of different cities in China. Okay. So you can actually use Google image search to fact check. Especially we talked a lot about verifying sources from user generated content. Um, and this is a trick you can have up your sleeve when you're trying to verify that content um, in the case that the, uh, you can't track down the person who posted it. So this is from a tweet. Uh, and you can claim that this guy claimed uh, that he took this picture in Chicago and it's just kind of a snarky comment about winter in Chicago. Now, this guy did some fact finding and he said, hey man, where did you get that picture? Google Images is saying that this is from Switzerland in 2005. Busted. Uh, so any guesses as to how he possibly knew that? How would he, how would he have done that, that kind of fact checking, yeah? 
Search by image, excellent. So all you do is you drag that photo into the search bar in Google. So you don't have to do anything too fancy. You just literally drag and drop it into the search bar at images.google.com. And then it'll give you a whole bunch of pictures that match the one that you dropped into the search bar. Um, so something also more timely, again, back to Thailand. Uh, Taxin, reported to be in Japan. Um, I've seen him around in Hong Kong too, I think, but I'm not too sure. So uh, there's this photo uh, taken by someone random. Um, and you wanted to verify, perhaps, uh, if this were indeed him. So um, you would kind of drag and drop this image into image search. No results older than three days. Uh, all the reports about it were kind of around the same time. So, you know, it's not conclusive, but it's, a good, it's good to know, right? It's a good way of verifying the source and verifying this fact. So another way to, to filter image searches is by color. So let's say you were digging more into the things that were happening in the South China Sea, and you wanted to get a black and white a black and white map, sorry, of this region. Um, how would you do that? Okay, any guesses? Um, so you would basically type in, right, map, map of South China Sea, and again, you can go to search tools, and you would get a drop down where you can filter by color. So you can actually choose only black and white images, or even choose a color tile here that corresponded um, to one of these colors to get results only relating to that hue. And then for a lot of you who are looking up, uh, especially uh, user-generated images, but you're not kind of sure about the usage rights, in advanced image search, you can also filter by usage rights. So here, um, down here under usage rights, you can choose the one that says free to sh use, share, or modify even commercially to make sure that you're not using um, any copyright protected images, um, and you can just make sure, because these images are all tagged with metadata, so it can basically tell you whether or not you can use these in your reporting. Um, now, GeoTools, which covers maps. I'll go through this quickly as well. Um, so, oops. Okay. Um, so a lot of you obviously use maps in your reporting when you're talking about a place. You're trying to get a more exciting visual to describe. Um, some, something that's happening. Um, and it's really, really easy. This is kind of the most basic way that you can use maps in your reporting in Google Maps. Uh, so for every single street view imagery, for every single location, there's a link that you can grab. It's just a hyperlink, and you can get this embed code and just paste it into your website. And so you can have an interactive kind of Google Maps experience right from your story. And you don't have to take a screenshot of it, uh, and it's, it's a much better experience. So this is an example of how the BBC used um, Street View imagery uh, as a kind of before and after comparison of what happened after the London riots uh, that burned down this building. And so they went kind of back in time and they looked up what it looked like on Google Street View to do a comparison. And more recently, we released this new feature called Street View Historical Imagery. Um, now this is from Tohoku uh, in Japan, the site of the Great Earthquake. Um, a couple years ago. And we actually drove through um, before the earthquake hit, and we drove the Street View cars after. And it was so dramatic, the shift in the tectonic plates was such that it actually, the, the road actually moved two meters uh, one direction. Um, but because of geolocation tagging, we were able to mark exactly the point at which this whole entire street had shifted. Um, so by the way, you're totally welcome to use this imagery, um, and you can just find it easily on Google Maps when you go to the place. And there's a little toggle um, where you can find, um, you can kind of go back in time. Um, Google Crisis Maps. Uh, we mentioned uh, Typhoon Haiyan earlier, and whenever there are these big disasters that strike, um, Google, you know, we believe in the value of data and sharing that open data just in time so people can um, get things like resources, they know which uh, roads are open, um, where the, the sick and dying are. So this thing is called the Google Crisis Map, and basically it allows anybody to pinpoint um, a place of interest. Um, they can say, okay, look, this is where there's a hospital, there's a shelter, this is where the roads are blocked, 
Um, this is where supplies are coming in. And this crisis map was basically being maintained around the clock um, as the crisis was being unfolded. So a lot of news media used this map directly and embedded it directly into their reporting. And you can do this easily. Again, same idea, you just take the HTML code. And the Wall Street Journal did this with our satellite imagery, where they had this awesome slider between um, what the area looked like before the devastation and after. And permissions, because I know that's on your minds. Um, basically, every time you use it, you're totally welcome to use it. Um, you just have to cite Google as well as a third-party data provider. In this case, it's Digital Globe um, for our satellite imagery. But usually, there's a watermark on the bottom of the image, and you just use that. Um, and there's also a mailing list that you can sign up to. So uh, it's really easy. Just go to g.co slash geomediatools. And basically, we won't spam you, but it's basically an email list that you'll get every time we upload a new satellite imagery um, that pertains to a piece of breaking news. So everything from the Colorado landslides um, to whatever typhoons are happening. So, and I just wanted to say um, and give a shout out to Heather Timmons, of course. Um, who, is, who wrote this awesome story, that it's not just about Google you know, putting information online to users, to media. It can work the other way, too. So Heather wrote the story about how the Taiwanese student protests, the Sunflower Movement, um, was preserved forever on Google Maps because the students took 360 panoramas of themselves occupying the legislative parliament, and they uploaded it onto Google Maps like anyone can. And now this political movement is, is digitally preserved for the ages. So it's, it's a really interesting time where, um, you know, there's a kind of this two-way dialogue of information being disseminated um, from data providers as well as just users. And that kind of gets me into YouTube and Hangouts and videos. So in addition to taking these panos, these photos, uh, the students, of course, live streamed their occupation of the protests. So when they were in the legislative UN, they set up a Google Hangouts on air, which they streamed onto uh, YouTube. In this case, this was uh, Apple Daily, Apple News, also going in there doing exactly the same thing. So you could see in real time the events that are unfolding. So, um, and actually it's the same platform that we're using today for the live stream of this very event. And there's a whole page here on YouTube for media, how you can basically, uh, find, discover breaking news on YouTube, use it in your reporting. And a lot, I get a lot of questions about formats. So this is just a kind of quick graphic that NPR put together on the kind of nine different formats that work the best. So uh, place explainers, basically pieces, short pieces that go behind the headlines, behind the scenes. Um, you know, major breaking news, obviously. Um, but I just want to show you a few examples. So Vice Media covered this. Um, you know, Ukraine news. And a lot of people ask, you know, how do I get ranked higher in uh, YouTube search findings? So fun fact is that, does anyone know what the second biggest search engine after Google is globally? Yeah, YouTube, that was kind of a setup. <laughs> but so YouTube is huge and it's used so much around the world that it's also very, very important to get high up in the rankings. So metadata is key here. What you use to tag your video uh, the name you gave it, um, you know, all the different tags. So, um, you know, it's really important basically to, again, you know, plug a lot of the keywords, the important keywords into your metadata. And recency is really important, right? So our algorithm will rank the most recent um, videos more highly. It will also rank videos related to breaking news more, more highly. Um, yeah. And basically, the idea for YouTube, the key here is to remember bite-sized chunks. So um, one way of getting people hooked onto your channel, hooked onto your uh, basically content, is by using playlists. So instead of uploading maybe a 15-minute video uh, that no one's going to sit through, uh, you might want to consider chopping it up into you know, two-minute, three-minute segments, but then linking it all up into a playlist so that if a person wants to keep continue, keep, keep continue, um, they can do that. And I know that I do this personally a lot with uh, Jimmy Fallon's uh, show, so they use it to great effect, and it's something for you to consider as well. Um, and lastly, just wanna end on Hangouts on Air. Um, and this is, this is an example. Um, how many of you actually know what Hangouts are? 
Okay, good. So quite a few of you. Um, so basically, Google Hangouts is a multi-person conferencing platform, and you can have up to nine people join in at one time. Um, so much better than Skype. So <laughs> you can actually um, broadcast this live to a global audience using YouTube, like we're doing now. So you can, um, the New York Times did this with John Kerry when the Syria crisis was unfolding. Um, they put it on their homepage. Um, and more recently, the Wall Street Journal actually took questions from readers uh, about Tiananmen Square, where they featured uh, journalists dialing in from four different locations um, to discuss the questions and discuss the Tiananmen protests. Um, so that's basically my presentation. Um, if there's anything that I leave you with, it's, I hope it's this website here. It's google.com slash media tools. Everything I discussed today is available right here um, on this website. And feel free to ask me any questions afterwards. But you can just click around here and explore. And you'll get a lot of resources here um, in your reporting. Um, and so I hope this has been helpful. If you have any, should we open up to questions now? Right, so um, I mentioned earlier that Google tries to be as relevant as possible to every single user. And now, if you search for cafes nearby in England when you're on google.co.uk, it's gonna be very different to cafes nearby to when you're searching on google.com.hk. So uh, primarily it's a kind of, um, to make sure that you get the most relevant results to your country in your language, for instance. Um, you know, obviously a person searching in Italian on google.co.it is gonna want a very different set of results than someone searching in English on google.co.uk. Okay, up there. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm Phoebe, I'm working in GMSC as a teaching assistant for some courses like data journalism. So I also help the students to do uh, to deal with the tools like Excel and also Google Fusion Table. And I, to my experience, I found that students feel like Google Fusion Tables are maybe the most difficult part for them because they have little knowledge about technology and programming. And also they just bump up with some errors that they cannot figure out. So do you have some like suggestions or some tips for them to you know, learn these tools by themselves and to fix these uh, errors by themselves? Thank you. Okay, wow, so I actually didn't get into Fusion Tables because it is a little more advanced uh, than just the straight up embedding. But Fusion Tables, for those of you who don't know, is a very basic way you can take um, Excel data, um, just data in a spreadsheet, and then turn it into this Maps form. Um, and it's fully integrated with the Google Maps API. Um, and the short answer to your question is it can be as complicated or as simple as you make it. So I've seen the use of Fusion Tables where it's really, really colorful. The map uh, API has been completely adapted and it's incredible. And I confess, I'm not a, an expert in this area, so I, I can't you know, fix your, uh, your concerns right away. But um, I will say that this website has a lot of tutorials on um, using Fusion Tables specifically and there's links to YouTube tutorials on how you can do that. Yeah. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship, uh, and I'm going to talk about the, the part that I hate. Um, okay. Well, uh, I, we distribute video uh, through YouTube. Um, our channels do about 50 million views a month, um, but YouTube acts like a gatekeeper uh, sometimes, and it's really frustrating because we're getting our content pulled down, and uh, there's very little that we can do about it. Uh, so, for example, this past week, uh, we uploaded a video of uh, the, ta the Taliban handover video. Uh, they were giving back the, the hostage. Uh, this was filmed um, by a media outlet uh, in Afghanistan. Um, but ITN uh, Channel 5 claimed ownership of this video. And therefore, we were blocked from showing you know, this video that we got from Reuters. Um, to our, our global audience. So we file an appeal and it takes about 30 days. Um, so basically ITN Channel 5 in the UK have claimed ownership of this video and they're the only ones that can show this video on YouTube and everybody else is blocked. So that's one example. 
another example recently, the Elliot Rogers video uh, in, um, in Santa Barbara. Obviously, that was a big news event, and everybody wants to include that video in its coverage, but that video was taken down within the first 24 hours uh, that it appeared on YouTube. And you know, we want to cover this story, but we don't want uh, to get our channel uh, blocked, you know, because YouTube has this uh, three strike system, and if you get three strikes, they, they basically shut your, uh, your channel down. So as a news editor, I'm, I'm sort of like, well, you know, I want to cover this story, but um, I don't want YouTube to, you know, uh, put a strike against me, and I won't be able to get my other videos out there. So that's, that's sort of like the, the love-hate relationship that I have, you know. It, we, we get 50 million views a month, uh, so if you're not on YouTube, you don't exist. But we're having to uh, make, you know, decisions uh, that, uh, you know, affects our coverage. And, you know, YouTube sort of is acting like a gatekeeper, and I'm very uncomfortable with, with YouTube having that editorial control over us. Yeah, I hear your concern, um, and I'm definitely sorry to hear the frustration. Um, you know, I think it's definitely an evolving thing. Um, and within YouTube, I know we have a lot of discussions, very vigorous ones, on um, things like balancing uh, violent coverage um, that you know actually violates our policies versus having freedom of speech. So, for instance, I know during the Arab Spring, right, there was a lot of discussion on whether or not we show the really graphic violence um, of you know the, the things that are unfolding on the streets there. Um, but I think I think it's just going to be something that we have to figure out long term. I don't have a good answer for you today um, on how to fix those two particular instances. But um, I think in this case, I think YouTube always tries to balance, and Google tries to balance freedom of expression with um, protecting kind of um, the, you know, the sensitivity, I guess, of, of our viewers. And for instance, it's different from place to place. And this kind of goes back to the domains for why we have different domains. Um, so for instance, in, in the Arab Spring case, we did block a lot of the violent videos. Um, let's say let's Innocence of the Muslims videos um, in a lot of the Arab countries that declared illegal. So, but we didn't um, in a lot of the different domains. So uh, it's a trade-off, um, and there's no really good answer for it. Um, but I, I definitely hear your concern. I'm just wondering with the, um, the crowdsourced um, crisis maps, have you guys experienced anybody abusing them just because it is crowdsourced? And I, it's a terrible question to ask, but this is the internet and there are trolls or truthers out there. They'll do terrible things. So, um, you know, has anybody, you know, reported or like added to the map in a way that was inaccurate just to mess with users? Um, yeah, not in the case of the Philippines, luckily. Um, and w we actually had a team of engineers uh, looking at the map and improving the map and checking data, checking the map uh, constantly around the clock. So in this case, um, it wasn't you know liable to abuse um, in that sense. Um, in that case, I, I think the heartening thing about that example is that everyone was really trying to pitch in and do the best thing um, for the country. But I can't think of any examples where, you know, especially in a time of crisis, um, some someone would want to do that. Uh, yeah, this lady. Hi, Joyce. My name's Jenny. I'm with the Wall Street Journal in Taipei. Just a quick question about Google Translation. Um, a lot of times I have to research stories that are written locally <clears throat> by the local media, and they're written in the local language. And sometimes I, 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 I just want to know what's the re reliability, how much can I trust in the Google Translation? Because sometimes when I... <laughs> When I read what's been translated from Chinese to English, I go, oh, no, that's not what I think I know. <laughs> so, I, so can you just um, talk t to us a little bit about like, what goes on be behind the translation service and how much can we trust it? Thanks. Yeah, I love how it's open season for you know, their complaints about Google products. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, so with Google Translate, the way it actually works is using something called machine translation. So uh, you take uh, thousands and thousands of documents uh, in English that has been translated into, let's say, French, and you feed those thousands and thousands of documents, and the, the machine algorithm matches uh, most commonly used translations for a word or a phrase or a sentence. Now, obviously, that's going to work the best for languages that have a lot of translations in between them. So uh, the European languages, English, French, et cetera. Um, and for the languages that are similar in syntax as well, because of the way that the, the scanning, the algorithm works. Um, and it's the worst, let me tell you, in Jap Japanese and Korean, because the syntax is totally different. And yes, you guys are nodding. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely um, something we're trying to improve upon. Um, 
but you know, we kind of, because we're relying on machine algorithms, we're re relying on a lot of data to kind of feed the beast. So we have to actually get a lot of you know, good human translations in order to make the whole algor algorithm and the whole experience better. So there's actually a place in Google Translate where you can submit your suggested translations. So you can actually click on the uh, phrase that it spits out and you can actually write in um, a better translation if you have one. Paul. Yay! <laughs> just, just a question is, so for a lot of journalists, you know, in the US they have, you know, Google media training, full day. So for people me, they want something that's more immersive. Uh, for example, where there's Fusion Table, and I know there's a whole thing about how you connect Google Hangout into breaking news reporting. What's the best way for them to actually um, do those learning? Um, you know, because I know you point to the website, but at times, like, Following the website could be quite difficult. So, is there someone that they should contact, and maybe we could set up something more immersive here? Yeah, that's a great uh, segue into um, the way you can contact me. Uh, my email's up there is joycehow@google.com, um, or you can email media tools at google.com, and that email goes to the team that Paul mentioned that trains up journalists all across the US. And they actually travel all around the world. So we'll make sure to keep you guys informed when they come through town probably later this year. So they are happy to sit down with you, um, come into a couple of newsrooms to do some hands-on training on things like in-depth fusion tables. So maybe we can even set something up with them here at, um, at the Journalism Center. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm from JMSC Hong Kong U. Thank you for your presentation. And before my question, uh, I just want to say the picture you showed uh, with the uh, Mumbai driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I happened to be on one of that orders when I was in Chennai with Wi-Fi. That was really interesting. And my question is um, uh, uh, about Google News. Uh, like uh, when I was doing research on China news, I, uh, especially from Chinese newspapers, I, I tend to use Baidu news search because I think they have more uh, comprehensive news uh, feeds. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, like uh, Google News, is it uh, has different um, strategies relating to uh, different, like uh, for the US news readers, you, um, you have, um, uh, is it just uh, different based on the locations or you have different? Yeah, I think know? the scope, the scope is quite different. So uh, Google, we obviously have to try to look at every single news source all around the world. So we try to reflect that in Google News. Um, for Chinese news sources, it is admittedly more difficult um, because I guess the engineers who work on this product are in the States. So I think, and Baidu kind of has a clearer scope, which is just within mainland China. Um, so. Yeah, we, we always try to have a kind of diverse set of news sources, but we always have to vet them to make sure that they are reliable and good news sources. Um, I'll take maybe a couple more, like two more. Um, this lady. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want to ask the question about uh, one production Google is Google uh, Flu Trends. Oh, Google Flu Trends. Flu -trends. Okay. That is still works well because so many people argue about it because some people say it works very well for real-time surveillance of influenza, but some people say it has so many problems. What do you think about it? Yeah, the thing to keep in mind, not just about flu trends, but about all of the trends that I showed you in general, is that it's just a reflection of Google searches. So it's not a reflection of sentiment. It's not a reflection of the actual event unfolding in time. So that's just the one thing. It's a proxy, right? Google searches are um, an indication, perhaps, of interest in the topic, um, maybe something that's in the news. But it's not ever an indication of the actual thing happening. So um, you know, I, I don't know about the many myriad reasons for why sometimes the trend might not match. Um, oftentimes, it does. But um, you know, I think that's just one thing to keep in mind, that there are a lot of factors at play here. Um, so I'll take one last question from this lady here. Hey, I'm Yolanda Ma, and I teach data journalism in China. Um, can we talk about two pretty new tools? One is the end-to-end, -end, the Chrome extension you launched like three days ago. It's uh, for secure emails, but it's not totally public yet. So when do you expect to pub uh, release that more publicly, and is there a date? And the other is the Lantern for the censorship, which is released, I think, last year, late last year, Google Lantern. So it's for people in China to 
unblock these sites. Um, I think these two new tools are very relevant to especially those who cover China here for secure emails and the censorship. Um, can I talk more about that? Yeah, I don't have anything to announce about the uh, encryption for when. We just announced it, so uh, we don't have many, any plans to talk about that here in Asia yet. So, um, and same with Lantern. That, as far as I know, it's an experiment that's happening with um, University of Oregon. So it's actually being led by them, that team. So I don't have a lot of announcements around that particular thing. Um, so it's time for fried chicken. I know you've been waiting for this for a long time. Thank you so much for hearing me out. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce.